Just ahead on Black Issues Forum, Vice President Kamala Harris visited Charlotte with a message about internet access and the fight for abortion rights. And a big picture conversation about the entire Kenley police force resigning. Stay with us. Welcome to Black Issues Forum. I'm Deborah Holt Noel. Vice President Kamala Harris visited Charlotte recently and sat down with local and state leaders to discuss a plan to make broadband more affordable and also talked about abortion rights. Senator Natalie Murdoch of Durham was one of the people at the table for the discussion, and she joins us now. Senator Murdoch, thank you so much and welcome. Hi, Deb. How are you today? Doing great. I hope you are as well. <laughs> Um, first, yes, tell us about the affordable connectivity program that uh, the vice president talked about and what that's going to mean for North Carolinians. Yes, um, something that uh, politicians and elected officials have to do is actually remind folks of the hard work that they're doing. And so a big part of the bipartisan infrastructure bill was this program. And so um, they are crisscrossing the U.S. to let folks know some $65 billion um, was appropriated to make sure that we can really um, bridge the gap with that digital divide. We just have far too many rural areas and even in urban areas, um, folks that do not have high incomes are still having an issue um, with broadband connectivity. And now it literally is a matter of life or death. So this program will provide 30 to 70 $25 per month to households that qualify. And we're really dependent on nonprofits and community centers such as that to help us get out the word so that folks that are eligible know that benefit is here for us for them to use. And will that be starting soon? Is that available right now? Yes, it is available now. Um, it is administered by the FCC here in North Carolina, um, the Division of Information Technology. They were also there um, along with their secretary. They are doing um, a lot of work to get the word out as legislators. We are letting our constituents know that this is a service to them because we know these internet bills are very high. Um, so the concept was it's difficult to get those bills down, but if we can at least say We'll provide a $30 to $75 credit per month to get those internet bills down so that you can get better connectivity and higher speeds. One of the most bipartisan things we are doing is providing more funding at the state level to really get more fiber to folks so that we can get those higher speeds in rural areas along with federal programs. So you will start seeing a lot more work um, going in on the ground to really physically increase that connectivity to deal with those last mile gaps and coverage of folks that are in really, really rural areas, particularly in the eastern and western parts of the state. So important. And the vice president also wanted to talk about abortion rights and access to that. We know that we uh, there are currently 12 states that ban this practice, uh, not including uh, North Carolina, or they impose very tight restrictions. What was the um, vice president's message to the group and for North Carolina? Yes, the vice president knew that North Carolina really is key. Um, we actually met with the vice president the same week that Georgia uh, put their abortion ban in practice. And so here in North Carolina, that medical procedure does remain safe and legal. Um, so want to begin with that, and it will, at least through the end of the year. And that is why the vice president was here. She knows that North Carolina and Virginia, we already have records of women traveling from as far as Louisiana. Um, to come to North Carolina and Virginia for their services um, since these bans are starting to be rolled out. And so she was really there to get the feedback of what we're already seeing on the ground. Georgia alone, some 1,500 cases will be transferred to North Carolina. So we are working really, really hard, especially those physicians, all of those facilities. And we also touched on topics such as safety and security. Um, those clinics are exposed and we will now unfortunately see protesters that will even come from other parts of the nation. Um, so we also had um, a conversation with, at the state level, 
um, director for public safety um, to ensure that all of the facilities are made secure, secure. Governor Cooper was there. He has signed an executive order along with President Biden. Um, so we got into a little bit more details of those executive orders that basically say um, we also don't want to criminalize individuals for coming to our state as well. Um, so we had a very, very robust discussion and the vice president let us know that she's doing everything that, that she can. Um, and we let her know that we thank her and, and President Biden and the administration for their um, support with this. Um, Planned Parenthood was also there to share their firsthand um, observations regarding the influx of people that we have seen coming to North Carolina seeking this care um, and access. Everyone can afford to hop on a plane and come to North Carolina and Virginia. Um, so access was a big topic as well. Well, we know that um, protests continue. And in fact, our own representative, Alma Adams, was recently arrested at the Capitol in D.C. while protesting uh, to advocate for abortion rights. So can you share uh, what's next strategically and policy-wise for women and others who are seeking to continue to have this option? We know that there are moves on both sides uh, to, you know, around abortion rights. And in fact, there are over 100, 150 some odd uh, bills that have been introduced by the GOP that are ready yeah. to restrict abortion rights um, nationwide if, if the Republicans lose in, or rather if they win in November. So what, what's the policy exactly. strategy? Yes, right here in North Carolina, the policy strategy is we've got to win. Um, we've got to hold the House and the Senate. We have two more years of not only Governor Cooper, but Attorney General Josh Don. So right here in North Carolina, we have to keep those same numbers, the same for the Supreme Court. If, if the case ever goes to the state Supreme Court, that needs to hold. Um, but more immediately at the federal level, U.S. Congress is working to codify um, a right to safe and legal abortion in addition to contraception. Um, that bill just made it out of the House last week. So we're really concerned about them cracking down on contraception and birth control. Um, that is a basic right that every woman and birthing person should have access to. Um, so we've got to get a handle on that and also have policies that make sure um, that you will not be criminalized for seeking abortion care. But as far as codifying it and to protect the right um, nationwide, is, has that train left the station? It has not left the station. It is still possible. Uh, as long as the House and the Senate are still in session at the federal level, it is possible. They started with contraception because we know that's very vulnerable. The Supreme Court has already signaled that. Um, next, we will work to um, codify abortion care at the federal level in Congress. Thank you, Senator Murdoch. If you'll stick around, want to continue this discussion and bring a couple of other guests in. The small town of Kenley, North Carolina, garnered national attention recently when it was reported that an entire police force handed in their resignations with the complaint that the city manager had created a hostile working environment. News agencies quickly picked up on the Facebook post by Kenley Police Chief Josh Gibson, who wrote, quote, I have put in my two weeks notice along with the whole police department. After 21 years of service, the new manager has created an environment I do not feel we can perform our duties and services to the community. He added, I have loved this community. It has become family and one of my greatest honors to serve. Altogether, seven people resigned, including Chief Gibson, four officers, and two town clerks. The city manager at the center of the alleged conflict is Justine Jones, a woman who the city proudly announced on May 11th as its pick among 30 candidates in a national search. Now, following a bonanza of media coverage, the Kenley Town Council has decided to launch an independent investigation. Let's talk about it. Senator Murdoch, thank you for staying with us. I want to welcome to the discussion Professor Lamisha Whittington and Dr. Taisha Paul, Assistant Professor of Management and Director of the Broadwell Leadership Institute at Fayetteville State University. So pleased to have all three of you with us. But I want to um, continue with you, Senator Murdoch. The facts remain to be revealed from the investigation. But mm -hmm. as a woman, as a black woman, when you heard this story, what questions came to mind for you? 
Um, yes, it's all very concerning. And, and I've also studied uh, public administration many moons ago. I wanted to be a city or a county manager. So um, really, really struck a chord with me because it is one of the most difficult jobs that you can have, especially coming out of this pandemic. And I think you said it perfectly. We need more facts. We need more information. Um, things are really still hearsay at this point. I would like to see more evidence of what this quote unquote hostile work environment was. Um, and this was a very short amount of time. I mean, she was just hired. So um, I just find it really difficult to believe that you could create such an environment in such a short amount of time and also to provide additional context. A number of towns nationwide, particularly those under 5,000 are seeing a number of these resignations. And I think it's more connected to the reckoning we've had as far as what it looks like to keep a community safe. I think all police departments are facing more scrutiny. Um, and I think that that probably had something to do with it as well. So I think there's definitely more to the story, um, but the town manager should hang in there. Um, read that she has some 16 years um, of experience. So I think that all the facts should come out before uh, we continue to uh, really attack her. This viral story even ended up in Time Magazine. And so that is a lot of scrutiny for someone who's only been on the job for about two months. Dr. Paul, what were your thoughts? Well, first, tell us a little bit about some of the spaces that you've worked in, your current work at FSU, and then certainly what came to mind when you heard the story. Sure. Thanks so much, Ms. Noel. Uh, in my 25 years of professional experience, I actually spent early on in my career several years working in local government in my hometown of Plainfield, New Jersey, working in the mayor's office. Uh, and it has a similar structure to Kenley in that there's a mayor, but also a full-time uh, city administrator. I've also spent some years working in brokerage for the firms of T. Rowe Price and Wells Fargo Advisors back when they were Wachovia Securities, and in the legal industry uh, with the firms of Miles and Stockbridge and DLA Piper, where I trained attorneys and their staff members. But I enjoyed teaching so much that after two degrees from Morgan State University, I went back for a doctorate from Hampton University uh, in order to transition into academia. So in academia, I've worked for Bowie State University, Hampton University, Barton College, and currently at Fayetteville State University. So when you hear this story, and you know, you, you teach on, uh, you know, uh, human resources and management, when you hear the circumstances of a case like this or a story like this, what comes to mind? So what comes to mind is immediately a sense of familiarity. What Ms. Jones is experiencing in Kenley is not uncommon in the experience of black female professionals. Uh, I do, though, wonder why in 2022 does this team of employees that have decided to exit um, their employment at Kenley, why do they feel that they can reject a duly selected government official in 2022. This is not 1898. Uh, and so that's a bit concerning, but also reminiscent of a very difficult past that we faced in this country. Well, L.A., what can you share with us? Thank you so much for that, Dr. Paul. But, L.A., what can you share with us about Johnston County, about Kenley, and the conditions in that community that, that speak to the presence of an what was an all-white police force. Right. So the uh, demography of Kenley is 36 percent black, 36 uh, percent white, 20 percent Hispanic. So when we talk about an all-white or majority white uh, police department that is actually not representative of the actual population that resides, the population is near 2,000. And so there have been local reports over the years, more recently in response to, of course, this news and the mass exodus of seven folks. There's still three part-time officers there, and they were already understaffed by five officers. Let's be very clear what we mean by mass exodus, so we're not engorging the actual reality or the truth um, of what seems to be internal conflict based on, again, uh, racism, racial um, discrepancies. And so when we're talking about Kinley itself, some local residents have said that there has been a history of racial profiling. And we see that three years ago when the SBI actually investigated, launched an investigation into Kinley for falsifying police reports. So there's uh, apparently a history of alleged falsification of police reporting and how they have engaged with the very community in which they are tasked to serve and protect. And so if they have a history of falsifying reports allegedly, then what is the distinction between an alleged false report of a toxic and hostile work environment now against, again, a new town manager that has only been in the job for 
a month, a month and a half. And so what we're seeing is really, and I, and I heard this both uh, with uh, the experts that I'm grateful to be joined on the call today or in the Zoom today, is the fact of the matter is this seems to be a model by which is being perpetuated in other communities in North Carolina across the nation that is a model to remove Black leadership. And what we're hearing is the term hostile work environment is very eerily reminiscent of I fear for my life or stand your ground. And so we're seeing that hostile work environment we saw in 2019 in Mooresville when the chief of police there was uh, placed on administrative leave because, again, his colleague said that there was a hostile work environment. And now Chief Damon Williams has gone on to serve uh, North Carolina Central University, which is where his tenure is now. He served other communities since then, but it was still the exact same language and the exact same tactic that is being used against the town manager, Justine Jones, right now. We have to be very cognizant and aware of what the tactic is and be very honest. And I think it's fairly interesting, th thank you, L.A., that there is a certain narrative that I'm seeing being, being driven, and, and it may be inadvertent, but what we're looking at is this woman, and who's being investigated is this woman's behavior. And yet, there were issues in the uh, community of Kenley that perhaps she was brought in to address. But, but it's as though she's on trial already. We've already asked questions about her background, um, what happened to her previous job. But I haven't seen anything in the media about the previous behavior or performance of anyone on the police staff. What are your thoughts about that? Wholeheartedly agree. I was honestly shocked at the reporting that I've seen. Um, I think the best framing I've seen has been from Time Magazine. Why did it take a national outlet to report this with some level of accuracy? Um, and and so Lamicia's point, this is not a mass exodus, honestly. I mean, you've, you've lost a number of officers even here from Durham to Fayetteville to Raleigh. Let me mention that. Everyone has shortages. Um, you know, the last few summers were difficult. So you're seeing a lot of law enforcement folks say, I'm going to do something else. I'm not going to stay in this profession. So this is not something that's unique to Kinley. And that has not been reported in addition to um, the issues that they have had um, in years past. Um, and also the public nature of the resignation shows that this was political. Um, they wanted to achieve a goal. They wanted to publicly embarrass this town manager. That is clear. Yes, I, I agree that's with right. that. Um, Paul, Paul, yes. that. Sorry, and that there's more information needed in terms of how, what examples and evidence do they have of a hostile work environment? Because there are some criteria, right? So a hostile work environment is where there's discrimination or harassment to a degree that it changes the terms and conditions of somebody's employment in terms of wages, promotion, demotion, access to benefits, et cetera, um, and that it affects negatively members of a protected group. Um, it can include intimidation, offensive behavior, and actual physical or mental abuse or persistent microaggressions, right? So in the information and even in the resignation letter and social media posts of some of the exiting employees, they've not mentioned those specifics. But I did also notice a clause in the resignation letter of the police chief in that he said that he would consider... Um, retracting his resignation if they removed Ms. Jones from her position. So really, it's almost an ultimatum. It's like a us or her sort of situation. Yes. Wow. Yeah. I, I, you, you're, you're spot on with that. And Dr. Paul, you know, when we take, take a look at this broadly, you know, what potential landmines do you see, given the dynamics of having a young woman, a young black woman, newly in a position of authority with an all-white male team? And it can be a police force, it can be a, a school, a public education system, it could be a corporate environment. You know, what can you share with uh, Young, young women who might find themselves in this situation or with anyone who is creating diversity, trying to implement DEI in their organization and, and it has this potential balance um, introduced to their organization. How do they need to be dealing with this? Well, the landlines that I foresee, some of them are already occurring in terms of work stoppage, lack of support from subordinates as well as from leadership. Um, I also see some landmines, including damage to, potentially damage to Ms. Jones' professional career, because really, even in terms of how the town council is exploring this, they're investigating Ms. Jones, who's been on the job for less than a quarter, less than a full performance year, um, rather than 
exploring what's going on in the police department. Is this mass departure indicative of any mm, poor departmental operations that they're now scared would be exposed? Those are some of the questions that uh, that came to mind to me. But also, I think that some of the landmines, we can kind of change our framing on how we consider those, right? Because this mass departure could be an opportunity. So Ms. Jones, provided that she keeps her role, now has an opportunity to build the workforce that the town of Kenley needs and deserves. She doesn't have to do the dirty work of cleaning house. They've kind of already done it for her. Great and point. So one of the main ways to positively change an organization's culture is to hire in the talent, the traits, the skills, and the values in the new employees, those values that you seek uh, to establish within the organization. Absolutely. And um, L.A., I imagine you've, you've worked in a variety of spaces as well. What would you say about, about dealing with the potential microaggressions and the existing microaggressions? And what are some of the microaggressions? Absolutely. I just want to plus one everything that Dr. Paul really just said and laid the foundation of what I'm about to just adjoin to. And so when we talk about microaggressions and the language they're in, we also have to talk about the hiring and firing practices. We saw in uh, the wake of the uprisings of 2020, uh, the protests against the person murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, that there was a surge of organizations, police departments that were responding to the defund the police right outcry that came from the community. And some of that response was, well, let's just hire representation and actually hire uh, Black professionals and experts to be in our departments. Okay, well, that's a band-aid to a deeper systemic problem. And what that means is that when you're looking at microaggressions, you also have to look at the fact, why was there already a culture by which Black professionals were not already hired or dutifully employed? Racism isn't just an organic environment by which it breathes in air or through the soil. It's actually perpetuated as an activation by people. People is what perpetuates racism. And it's the professionals that reside already within the departments that made the decision not to hire Black professionals professionals before the uprisings, not to hire black experts and to actually do nationwide searches for qualified candidates prior to being urged to that direction by the general public. So if we're not really looking at the depth of the department to say who needs to be hired and who needs to be fired, that perpetuated the systemic inequities in hiring, then when you hire that black professional, that expert, you're bringing them into an already hostile, toxic work environment by which they are given the burden of fixing. And that's not within their jurisdiction to fix legacy and generation, generational wealth or racism. Excuse me. Wow. That's a great point as well. Senator Murdoch, you certainly, I would imagine, have had to encounter this in some capacities. Here you are working uh, in politics now, and you, you have the... Yes. You, you, you are surrounded by uh, individuals who, who don't look like you all day long, but you're, but you're getting along and you're navigating those waters. What would your advice be to anyone who is in your position to continue to um, do your job and, and, and build networks and not only uh, business relationships, but friendships where you work? It does happen a lot, um, and I think there are a number of things you can do. You definitely need to have allies. This is something that you cannot do alone. Um, I've worked for a number um, of local governments across the state of North Carolina, um, and typically the town manager, the city manager, the city attorney, those were always folks that I reached out to early and often um, just to ensure <laughs> um, that I would have allies um, that were those top decision makers, but as an elected official, um, pretty much the, the, the same. Um, kind of process is, is what I utilize daily of, you know, treating staff well um, and, and documenting things. If you are aware of something, um, you do have to have a record of it. As we've mentioned today, we haven't seen any record um, of a hostile work environment that they speak of. And so in the event that there is an incident, you need to have a clear record of how you recall that situation to have unfolded so that um, if it does unfortunately escalate into something legal, you do have um, those records and um, just really, really leading with integrity, leading with class, because unfortunately, um, as a black woman, you are more likely to be attacked. And so you really have to um, have all of your ducks in a row and to not 
um, overtly give someone um, a reason to complain about your leadership or your management style. Um, but unfortunately, it is a sign of the times. And um, I, I think the doctor said it perfectly of they can utilize this as an opportunity to say, let's build the town that we want, the staffing that we want that reflects the culture and values and um, hiring really, really key people that will also support you and have your back um, is, is another strategy that is also very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Paul, I'm going to give you what might be the last word in terms of advice to young people who are entering the workforce and might find themselves in this position. Advice that I would give to young people is uh, in part similar to what we've been taught growing up. You have to be twice as good to be seen as equal. But even sometimes that won't prevent the microaggressions from occurring. Uh, so what I would say is, as Senator Murdoch mentioned, document when they occur. Be prepared to advocate for oneself and to establish relationships with one's allies. Um, and also to know what's out there for you, uh, know what you're up against. We operate in a professional environment where the wage gap still persists where black women are historically undervalued, undercompensated, despite being the most educated segment of the U.S. population, with literally 10 percent of black women in the U.S. pursuing college degrees at the undergraduate and graduate level right now. Dr. Taisha Paul, thank you so much for that advice. Lamisha Whittington, thank you. And Senator Natalie Murdoch, we appreciate all three of you for, for being here today. Thanks so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I want to thank all of our guests for joining us today, and we invite you to engage with us on Twitter or Instagram using the hashtag Black Issues Forum. You can also find our full episodes on pbsnc.org slash Black Issues Forum or listen at any time on Apple iTunes, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. For Black Issues Forum, I'm Deborah Holt-Noel. Thanks for watching. Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting PBSNC.